Cool. So, yeah, thank you for yeah coming and listening to me this morning. Uh, as mentioned, I mean, yeah, my talk is called Action Anomalies, and it's about uh, a hacker's guide to GitHub Actions. Um, and hopefully this will be useful for kind of pen testers, security engineers, or bug hunters to either secure your actions in your company or to yeah find bugs in workflows and repositories that are public that you can use for bug bounties or just for uh, causing chaos or having fun. So just the obligatory who am I slide. My name's Elliot. Uh, I'm a yeah, security researcher at Sneak and yeah, ex-pen tester, ex-security engineer. Um, in my spare time, I like skateboarding. In the winter, snowboarding. Um, yeah, I like beer and I play way too much RuneScape. So if there's any RuneScape players here, let me know and uh, we can do some raids. And that is my cat on there as well who helps me with my work. Uh, so kind of just about the agenda. So we'll briefly go over just who we are at Sneak Security Labs, what are GitHub Actions, um, and then we'll look at the threat landscape and some misconfigurations, um, and then we'll go over some of our findings that we found in some high-profile repositories, um, and also introduce our GitHub Action Scanner tool, um, which you can use to automate a lot of the things that we're talking about in this slide or in this deck. Um, so let's yeah, go on. Um, and then just to briefly introduce Sneak for those who don't know us. Uh, Sneak is a software security company that aims to provide developers with the tools to stay safe uh, when building systems. And we have a range of products including dependency scanning, static analysis, uh, container scanning, infrastructure as code scanning, and general app AppSec risk management. It's not a sales pitch, but if you want to know more, we have a, a booth upstairs. Um, go speak to them or come and speak to yeah, me and I can also yeah, tell you a bit more. And then at Sneak, I work in a, a team called Security Labs. And we are a small security research function. And we try to focus on high impact security issues that affect developer and open source security. Uh, the most recent of which that you may have heard of is Leaky Vessels, which was a, a collection of four zero days in the Docker Run C and Build Kit components. Um, and if yeah, there's anyone here that's working at a cloud provider or self-hosting Kubernetes clusters, you may have had fun patching these. Um, and we've also found zero days in popular JavaScript libraries such as Lodash, Linux distros such as Ubuntu, um, and looked at AI-related platforms such as Hugging Face and Langchain. So let's get on with the, the main content here. Um, so what is GitHub Actions? So GitHub Actions is a, a CI CD system that's integrated directly into GitHub and it facilitates kind of tasks that you may associate with a software lifecycle such as building, testing and deploying software. Uh, CI CD stands for continuous integration and continuous delivery. Um, and yeah, the workflows themselves are actually defined within your GitHub repository. So just before we get into kind of the details of GitHub Actions, let's first just familiar ourselves with yeah, what a typical GitHub workflow would look like. So the, basically here we have a GitHub repository on a main branch and this is where our code lives. Uh, and then when we want to basically add some new features, add some new code, we typically uh, create a feature branch, uh, which is then separate from the main branch of the repository. Um, and then we can make our changes. So we add our commits to the feature branch. And then once we're ready, we can open a pull request to merge those changes back into the main branch. Then we merge the branch into main. Um, and then we have our changes on the main branch. Uh, and then we can go ahead, delete our feature branch, and then we have all of our code nicely into main. Um, and that's kind of just like a typical workflow. And this is where GitHub Actions would kind of fit into these steps. So kind of, yeah, with that, with that out of the way, um, yeah, why do we need to use GitHub Actions or care about using CI, CD platforms at all? Um, and they're really useful because they allow us to easily integrate into that kind of typical Git workflow that we've just seen. Um, and this allows us to do lots of things throughout those stages of the life cycle. So we may, we may want to run some tests or security tests during the pull request when it's opened before we merge it. Um, and then like once we've merged in, we may want to build artifacts uh, once it's been met, moved into the main branch and then deploy it to yeah, some upstream system or something. So now that we kind of understand why we might want to use GitHub Actions, we can now have a look at 
kind of how this works to get a better understanding and be in a good position to understand the threat landscape and see how can we attack these and uh, yeah, defend our, our GitHub workflows. So GitHub Actions basically automates workflows within your repository. Um, and these are triggered by events such as pull requests or somebody creating an issue. Um, and then these workflows are basically made up of jobs that execute on runners, um, either sequentially or in parallel, uh, depending on how this is configured. And each job consists of steps that execute uh, yeah, defined scripts or reusable actions to yeah, help simplify your workflows. So kind of what is a workflow? I mean, the workflow is defined in a YAML format, um, and then this file, uh, or these files are located within a directory within the GitHub repository called .github slash workflows. Um, and if we want to have multiple workflows in a, a single repository, so we may have one for kind of building, one for like checking the spelling of our markdown files or whatever, um, but we can create these in separate YAML files within this directory. Um, and then they can be highly configured as we'll shortly see. Um, and these are triggered by events uh, or manually or based on a schedule. So what are events? Uh, so events are basically specific activities that will trigger execution of workflows within our GitHub Actions. And there are a few different common types of events. The ones that we'll most likely be seeing when we're kind of uh, looking to exploit something or the events that you may be concerned about as a defender will be things like pull requests, pushes, uh, issue creation, or just other kind of in-repo activities. Um, and then we can also have external events, and these are facilitated by a separate event called Workflow Dispatch or via the GitHub API. Um, and then again, these workflows are, or sorry, the events are configured with inside the workflow YAML file. Um, and we do this using the on keyword, which defines kind of when and where the workflow will run. Um, and this can be customized with event filters uh, that basically allow us to like only run if the branch, the, the pull request is merging into this branch or uh, only run if files within this directory have changed. Um, and it just allows more granularity on when we want those uh, workflows to run. So again, yeah, within the, the GitHub Actions workflows, we have jobs. And jobs basically provide a structured approach to managing execution. Each job groups related tasks that are designed to accomplish a specific job uh, within the workflow, such as running security analysis tools or building your code base or deploying to a defined environment. Uh, and these jobs are broken down into steps, uh, which are the individual actions to achieve that task. So each step is either going to be a shell script that's going to be executed or it will be a pre-built action uh, that will be run. Uh, we'll discuss the steps more in the next slide. Um, and then, yeah, you can configure the jobs to also have dependencies with each other. Um, but by default, jobs do not have dependencies. And when they don't have dependencies, they're all run in parallel. Um, but yeah, we basically, we, we can make the, we, we can set these dependencies and we, this can be useful if we want to kind of first compile something and then deploy it. Um, so this kind of could be done in this way. And then when that's, uh, when we have the, the dependencies, then they will run in parallel. Uh, not in parallel, uh, sequentially. And it will depend on the successful operation of the previous job. Um, and then, yeah, finally, yeah, each job is basically executed within its own environment. Um, so any environment variables and mounts will not be the same across different jobs, uh, even if it's in the same workflow. Uh, so then we yeah, have uh, yeah, steps, um, and the steps are basically where jobs are further broken down. Uh, so these steps, again, as I've said, are the building blocks that define the individual actions that are required to uh, yeah, complete that job-specific task. And each step generally represents a single, well-defined action within kind of the broader workflow. So you have kind of two main approaches to how you define steps. Uh, you can basically craft your own shell script um, to perform a specific action required for that step. Uh, so this may be kind of like we run npm install uh, or we yeah, do something else or 
we can use uh, leverage the pre-built GitHub actions for common tasks. So these are basically pre-written code snippets, often referred to as actions, um, and these save you a lot of time and effort um, by providing kind of common functionality. Uh, like kind of checking out a code repository or uploading an artifact um, and these can be kind of these can be imported directly from github repositories uh, or from the github action marketplace uh, so I mean the github action marketplace is more of a registry for uh, all of the various public github actions that we can use um, but then when we import these we actually just reference the, the repository that it exists in uh, so yeah, all the steps within a job uh, share the same environment on the allocated runner machine uh, that has been assigned for execution. And this share and shared environment is crucial because it allows us to, to share data between steps. For example, we could have one step that downloads the code and then a subsequent step that analyzes the, the downloaded code using uh, some data from the first step. Um, and then regardless of the steps defined type being a script, container image, or pre-built action, all of these steps within that same job will, same, will share the same network, uh, environment, and volume mounts. So they will become, this will become useful for us later when we start looking at kind of how to attack these. Um, and then finally, by default, the, the steps within a specific job are going to be executed sequentially. Um, and this means that, yeah, one step will run, or the steps will run one after another. Um, and this is quite beneficial because, yeah, when we need to kind of share data between them, uh, we can quite easily do this. So then we have kind of the concept of GitHub Actions. Uh, and these are the pre-built code modules um, that automate specific tasks within our workflows. This eliminates the need for us to write repetitive code for common actions like checking out code, uploading artifacts, or even running a sneak scan. Um, and basically to, to use a pre-built action, we can simply just reference the desired action within the workflow YAML uh, using the users keyword. Um, and there are kind of three primary ways to locate actions. So we can have local actions, and these are the custom actions that are defined within our own repository. Um, and when we reference these, uh, we do this using kind of dot slash to, and then a path within the uh, repository. Uh, the default one would be action.yaml. So if we gave just dot slash, then it would reference the action.yaml at the root of the repository. Then we can also have GitHub hosted actions, and this is where we can reference public GitHub repositories or an internal repository if it's configured to allow access to workflows. Um, and then, yeah, we reference these in both cases uh, in the format of owner slash repo and then some sort of reference. So this could be a commit hash, it could be a version tag, um, or we could just leave this off and then it would use kind of the, the main branch. Um, so yeah, for example, the, the common one that we'll see a lot is action slash checkout. Um, and this is the latest version of the, the official GitHub checkout action, uh, which is in, yeah, the, the public repository actions. Um, and then finally, we can also use container images. And to, to leverage a containerized action from Docker Hub, we can use the syntax of uses Docker colon slash slash image, uh, colon tag. And then when it comes to actually executing the workflows, we have two options. So we can use GitHub hosted runners, uh, and these are provided and managed by GitHub. And when we use these, GitHub takes care of the infrastructure and ensuring the availability of the runners. Whereas in contrast, when we have self-hosted runners, these are going to run on our own infrastructure. Um, and yeah, we can put this on premise or in a cloud environment, and it gives us full control. And then next we have to consider the environment consistency. So when we use GitHub hosted runners, this provides a fresh environment for every job. Uh, and this runs inside a kind of a new machine uh, to avoid any leftover artifacts. Um, meanwhile, self-hosted runners maintain the machine state between workflows and jobs. So this is useful for kind of caching dependencies, but it's going to require careful management. Regarding customization, the GitHub hosted runners offer limited options. So with these, we can only choose from the operating system. So we can choose kind of like a Windows or Linux. Um, and this is defined with the runs on keyword in the uh, workflow. Um, whereas with kind of self-hosted runners, 
This allows us full customization. Um, here we can install any specific tools, libraries, or configurations that we're going to need for our projects to do their actions. Um, but then, yeah, with this, maintenance is going to be another key difference because with the GitHub hosted runners, these are fully managed by GitHub. GitHub's going to handle the update security patches for you. You don't need to worry about this. Whereas if you're using a self-hosted runner, on yeah, the other hand, it requires your team to kind of manage all of the maintenance tasks, such as yeah, security and software updates. Um, and while it may give, you may avoid giving some of your sensitive data to GitHub, uh, you're also then responsible for the actual server uh, used, and you need to make sure that it's appropriately firewalled, it's not in the internal network and reaching everything else. So there's a, a bit of a trade-off there. So what, what does this look like? So kind of on the left here, we have an, an example GitHub YAML uh, workflow. And at the top, we have the name. Below this, we kind of have the uh, the event trigger. And in this case, it's the uh, push um, event. Um, and then below that, we have an event filter where basically we're checking that the branch to run this, it has to be a push to the main branch. So any pushes to feature branches will not trigger this workflow. Below this, we have uh, two jobs defined, one named job1, uh, and we can see there that it runs on the GitHub hosted runner, um, and then it has kind of two steps, one that uses an external action, uh, which is actions uh, checkout. This will go ahead and check out the uh, repository into the current directory, um, and then we have just the shell script in the second step. Um, and then we have our job2, and in this case, this has a dependency on the successful execution of job1, um, which is kind of yeah defined with this needs keyword, um, and then yeah this job just has uh, one action, one step, which is just uh, a basic shell script. So when we're using workflows, I mean, how does it check out from GitHub? Like, how do we actually communicate and authenticate with GitHub? So this is handled through something called the GitHub token, um, and this is a yeah temporary token that is generated for every single workflow and this allows the repository uh, sorry the workflow to authenticate against github in the context of that repository um, the permissions for this they vary um, so for repositories and organizations created uh, before 2022 the default for this was read write uh, whereas for organizations that were created uh, after or within 2022, uh, the default is now read-only. But the important thing there to also note is this is based on the organization uh, and the defaults that the organization had. So even if you had an organization that was created in 2020, if you create a new repository now, this will still use the read-write uh, default permission. But these can be customized via uh, the workflow, fl workflow file, um, or the organization or repository settings um, and kind of yeah how, how we use this uh, so within our workflow if we want to get access to this github token we can basically do this by uh, using the secrets context so we can reference yeah curly brace curly brace secrets github token uh, and then yeah this is useful if we want to do any cloning pushing creating issues commenting on something um, but it also allows access to the github api and this will be quite useful for us later uh, so you might be wondering kind of how the permission scope for the workflow can be modified uh, and we can basically make these changes at the enterprise organization or repository level uh, and to do this, we basically need to go to the appropriate settings page within GitHub and then select actions and then general. And then we'll see what we have on the screen here um, and we can find the, the workflow permissions. Uh, so we can basically set this to be kind of read and write, just read, um, and that's that. So changing the permissions of the enterprise organization or repository level, it's quite powerful because it's going to affect all workflows by default. However, the control is somewhat limiting as it simply sets read or write to all scopes. Um, so we can also get more granularity over this and have a bit more detailed control over the GitHub token uh, by basically setting the permissions during the workflow execution. Uh, 
Uh, and we can do this by using the permissions block in the workflow file. So we can basically specify the exact scope and permissions uh, level that we need for each task. The actual documentation for the permission scopes has room for improvement, and we did find it quite difficult to know exactly what the limitations were for each of the scopes. Um, but for us, uh, attacking or securing workflows, uh, there are some important permissions that we might want to consider. Kind of the most important one for us is generally going to be the content scope, uh, because when this is set to write, this allows us to make changes to various parts of the repository itself, such as creating releases or merging pull requests. Interestingly, the pull request scope uh, doesn't actually allow you to merge pull requests, um, but this one's rather just for you to do things such as adding comments and labels to the pull requests. Um, both of these can also be quite useful for us uh, as attackers, uh, which we'll see later. Um, and yeah, like you may have kind of some things where a workflow will only run if it's been given a specific label, um, and if we can kind of control something uh, that has the pull requests, then we can potentially add labels to other pull requests. So it can be quite quite useful for us. And then we have secrets, and secrets are essentially variables that are created at different levels within GitHub, which include the organization, the repository, or a repository environment. Um, and these secrets contain sensitive information like API keys, tokens, uh, passwords needed to interact with external services. Um, and this could be anything from pushing to Docker Hub to storing the results of a SAS scan or deploying something to production. Um, but one critical point regarding secrets is that they're not implicitly exposed to the workflow jobs. Um, so they need to be made available via an input or an environment variable within that workflow. So if we look at uh, yeah, the example that we have down there, um, basically we have the secret area 41 and we're exposing this to the hello world step of the job. And this means that that specific step is able to access those secrets as needed, but other steps in that same job will not be able to access that, that secret. Um, some other important points to note are the hierarchy of overrides when secrets are defined at multiple different levels. Um, and yeah, the GitHub will also automatically redact secrets if they're printed to the logs. Um, uh, and another important point is when we have repository environments, these can be configured to have uh, yeah, required reviewers. And basically what this means is that when a workflow uh, which yeah, depends on secrets to run. Uh, it will not run until one of the defined authorized approvers uh, from a configure, configured list uh, approves that workflow to run. Um, so this can cause some problems in some cases. So we're at slide 27 now, and all we've covered is kind of how to merge a branch and been given a basic introduction to GitHub Actions, so like, where are the vulnerabilities? <laughs> um, but that was necessary for us to understand some of the attacks that we're going to see. Um, so now let's explore kind of some of the vulnerabilities and misconfigurations that we might typically see when we're auditing our companies or searching for the next high payout. So like, the first typical one is your traditional command e command injection. And this can happen when user input is passed unsafely to a script or vulnerable action. And basically events may contain, user, well, many different events contain user controllable fields that may not be obvious. Um, and this just leads to a standard command injection attack. So you may be able to, if you have one of these uh, fields on the right, uh, GitHub issue body, GitHub issue title. That would then be kind of yeah, concatenated into a shell, a shell script, and then you can do like your typical command injection, so substitution, blah, blah, blah. Um, but that's not too interesting. Um, but we'll, we'll look at this a little bit. Um, so kind of here we have uh, an example for a command injection work, a vulnerable command injection workflow. So basically we have a workflow that is going to be run when an issue is opened. Um, and first of all, this will check out the, the code and then it will basically 
run a script, but it will pass the title of the issue in that script. And in this case, let's say it's a Slack notification. So whenever the issue is opened, it sends a message via Slack, and we, we go ahead and look at that issue. Um, so, but what happens if we create a title that has basically a command injection payload in it? I mean, it seems very trivial, and it <laughs> shouldn't work. But uh, if we go ahead and do this, um, and then we go look at the action that's been run, uh, we can see that we have code execution within that workflow. Um, so how do we protect against this? Um, basically, we can basically sanitize our inputs the same way that we always do. Um, and within a GitHub workflow, we can do this by basically using an environment variable as an intermediary value. Um, and then this will be appropriately sanitized. Um, and then once this is passed to run, it's no longer going to be expanded, and we don't have this uh, yeah, command injection anymore. So if we look and run this again, we can see that we don't have any command injection anymore. So let's get to some more interesting bugs. And one particularly problematic feature of GitHub uh, actions is the handling of forked repositories. So forking basically allows developers to add features to repositories for which they lack uh, permissions uh, by creating a copy of the repository, complete with its entire history under the user's namespace. Um, and then developers can then work on the fork repository, create branches, push code changes, and eventually open a pull request back to the upstream repository, also known as the base. Uh, and then after an upstream maintainer reviews and approves this pull request, those changes can be merged into the base repository. In the context, in the context of the forked repository, referred to as the, the context of the merge commit, in GitHub documentation, uh, this the the user has complete control. So in the forked repository, like I can do whatever I want because I own this. Um, there's no restrictions on who can fork. Uh, so if it's a public repo, anybody can fork it. And this creates a security boundary that GitHub is aware of. Um, for example, the the pull request event, which is recommended for PRs originating from forks, because uh, it doesn't have access to the base repository's context and secrets. Whereas conversely, the pull request target event, this has access to the base, repos base repository's context and its secrets. Uh, and this yeah, often includes read-write permissions for the reasons that we've seen before with the kind of uh, overly verbose defaults for the, the GitHub token. Um, and then, yeah, suppose this event does not validate inputs such as branch names, PR bodies, and artifacts originating from that fork. In those cases, we can compromise that security boundary and potentially uh, leading to hazardous effects on the workflow. So this leads us to kind of an issue that's more widely known as a pwn request. And this is a scenario that occurs when a workflow mishandles the, the pull request target trigger, uh, potentially compromising the GitHub token on the way and leaking its secrets. So kind of three scenarios or three specific conditions need to be met for this to be exploitable. So first, we need to have a workflow that's triggered by the pull request event target. Uh, the pull request event target runs in the context of the base repository of the pull request, um, not within the context of the merge commit, and uh, as the pull request event does. This means that this workflow will execute code in the context of the upstream repository, which a user of the fork repository should not have access to, uh, and this consequently allows the GitHub token, uh, with its finally uh, which is frequently granted the right permission. Um, and then this pull request target event is intended to be used with safe upstream code. So hence, uh, yeah, an additional condition is needed to, to break this boundary. So then secondly, we need to have an explicit checkout from the forked repository. And this is done by modifying the reference input of the checkout action to yeah the pull request head ref. Um, and by this point, uh, we point the, the reference to the fork repository and check it out. And then this means that we can control arbitrary files within the workspace uh, that the workflow is going to be operated on. If it does something dangerous with those files uh, that have been checked out, 
we can quite trivially get control of parts of the workflow. Which leads us to the final requirement for a perm request, and this is where we need to have some way to execute code or inject some command in the workflow processing, uh, and this is where the damage is going to occur. So suppose an attacker has complete control over the checked out code. In that case, they can replace any script that gets executed in subsequent steps with their malicious version, modify a configuration file with command execution potential, such as modifying uh, a package JSON for NPM with a uh, pre-install script, or exploit a command injection vulnerability that may be present within a step uh, to execute arbitrary code. Uh, the extent of the damage really depends on the permissions that are configured, and whether there are yeah, any secrets to be leaked to compromise additional services. Um, and since the GitHub, GitHub token lifecycle is limited to the duration of that running workflow, we need to basically perform our actions within that workflow. So kind of here is an example of a, a vulnerable perm request. Um, so we basically have the use of the uh, yeah, pull request. Uh, the pull request target uh, event trigger. Um, and then secondly, we're going to pull from the pull request head instead of the base repository. And then finally, the last step is running make, um, which will obviously work. Provide It's going to work fine, providing that the pull request author didn't remove the make file from the forked repository. Um, but more importantly, the pull request author now controls that make file. So they can basically put anything that they want and it's going to execute directly. It's, it's going to directly execute the arbitrary code. Um, and then you can notice in the line above this step when it also assigns the Docker Hub API key to an environment variable. Uh, this will be available in the environment when that step runs. So this would also allow the attacker to leak this key. So if we go ahead and uh, make a pull request, modify the make file, um, and then once we've yeah, done that, the job is going to kick off, and we can see that then we've got code execution based on the opening a pull request. So this is a difficult issue to fix, and this is kind of because it's more of using the wrong tool for the wrong job in most cases. So kind of it's intended for kind of trusted uh, kind of workflow or operations, and we need to make we, we need to be careful uh, and make sure that we're using pull request target as it is by design um, because it does execute in the context of the base repository. Uh, there are some compensating controls that exist. So one, for example, we have uh, we can specify that the job will only run from pull requests from contributors, but this is quite trivial to bypass because we just need to search the repo for a typo fix the typo, make a pull request, and then once that's merged, we're then going to be contributor on that repo, and then we can go ahead and submit our malicious pull request. And then we also have the repo environment, uh, which allows the required approvers. But the workflows are often used to kind of check the quality of the PR, uh, such as like doing some linting, running a security test, running some normal functional tests. Um, and it's not obvious that when you do, when you run those tests, um, like it sounds like it's going to be benign and most people wouldn't see this as a problem to approve it because it's just doing something that needs to be done for them to check whether or not the pull request is good or bad. So GitHub uh, introduced the workflow run trigger, uh, workflow run event at the same time that pull request target was introduced. And workflow run basically enables scenarios that require uh, processing untrusted code, but also need write permissions for some other action, such as updating a PR um, comment or pushing something to somewhere. Um, so basically, this allows us to, to use pull request to process some untrusted code. Um, and then we can configure workflow run to be invoked when that pull request workflow has completed successfully. Um, whereas the pull request workflow is going to be completely unprivileged. It's not going to have access to any secrets. It can just do some task. And then once it's run successfully, then the privileged workflow kind of picks it up and does what it needs to do. Um, and while this is safer and it's the recommended approach from GitHub, uh, this still represents a security boundary that we can potentially abuse. 
So yeah, as previously mentioned, Workflow Run is an event that was introduced alongside pull request target. Um, and yeah, basically allows us to execute a workflow based on execution of another workflow. So the workflow started by workflow run event is able to access the secrets and write tokens, even if the previous workflow didn't. Um, and this is useful because where we have like a workflow that is intentionally not privileged, uh, but we need to take a privileged action later, um, we can basically use this to exploit it. So in order for this to kind of be exploitable, we need the following conditions to apply. So we need to have control over the triggering workflow. So we open a pull request that's using the pull request event, um, and it does something. We can put whatever we want there, and it's going to run in the context of the merge repository. We don't have access to secrets. It's intended to run unsafe code. It's fine. But then we have a workflow that's automatically invoked after the successful execution of the previous job. Um, and this one is going to basically have access to those secrets. And if that workflow run job uh, does something dangerous, such as checking out from the trigger branch or misusing artifacts from the, the trigger branch, then it's going to potentially lead to the same scenarios that we have with the perm request. So kind of this is like how this could look in uh, in practice. So basically on the left, we have the unprivileged pull request. It's going to run just on a pull request being opened. And it doesn't do much. It basically just sets up node, installs some dependencies, and runs a test. And then we have our privileged workflow on the side. Um, and this one, once our unprivileged workflow is finished successfully, the tests ran, uh, so everything's fine. Um, then it goes ahead and basically checks out the repository, sets up node again, and then does an install. Um, but this is bad because we can then basically just modify uh, our... We can put a npm pre-install script in the package JSON, and yeah, because we're end ending up with this being in the... Uh, privilege workflow in the end, we essentially have the same thing and we can execute arbitrary code. So sometimes these issues being present are not enough uh, and we may only be able to control kind of parts of the workflows or parts of the steps um, and we need some tricks that we can use to actually build useful proof of concepts um, to be able to actually exploit stuff. So for code injection, to get an initial control over the workflow step, um, a couple of things that we have. So we could be able to control direct direct files that are used within a step. So that maybe it invokes a shell script, or maybe uh, it runs a JavaScript file. And in those cases, we can just modify that uh, file, and we're going to be able to have the code injection. We can also basically uh, live off the pipeline, and there are many tools that will get executed. Uh, well, many tools that will inadvertently execute untrusted code just as part of its, the way it works. There's a great resource there um, that has kind of a whole list of different tools that you can use. Um, but some examples, I mean, like if you run npm install, you can basically set a pre-install script with pip. You can use setup.py, eslint. Uh, you <laughs> normally have like a .eslint rc file. Um, but you can also have a .eslintrc.js, um, and then it's just a JavaScript file. You can put your arbitrary JavaScript in there, and when it's evaluating in the config, uh, it's going to run your code, which is great. Um, and then also make, I mean, if we control the make file, we have code execution. Uh, we also have kind of local actions. So when we're using a local action, um, it's going to use kind of uses dot slash in the step, um, and in that case, we can basically modify the actions.yaml or modify the entry point that's defined in that uh, actions.yaml. And then we can just put our code there, and, and this will also work. Another useful thing that we discovered was called, uh, well, we, we called it step poisoning. Um, and this is basically, it's often quite common that you will only be able to control a single step, and you may not have access to the secrets. Uh, so when we can control that one step, um, like, I mean, if we look at the example here, we basically, we check out from the repo, we set up npm, and then the step that we control is the npm install, because we can use the technique from the previous slide. Um, but then the next step is deploy to S3, where it 
basically takes this and deploys our static website. Um, but in that case, we don't control, we, we don't have code execution in that step. So we don't have access to that secret because it's not referenced in our step. Um, so that, that's problematic. Um, we control, we've got code execution in one place, but we don't have access to the interesting stuff. Um, so kind of what we can do, um, certain environment variables can be useful here. Um, and there are known dangerous uh, environment variables uh, that GitHub are aware of, such as yeah, node options. Um, but this is restricted in workflows, and if you try to set this, it's going to reject it. Um, but we found that LD preload uh, has seems to have been forgotten. Um, so basically, we can leverage LD preload to uh, yeah, basically create a, or load a shared object um, that's going to have some functions that are going to be invoked instead of the legitimate ones. So kind of how, how this works in practice, uh, here we have kind of uh, an example where we have a JavaScript file that's our command injection point, and inside this file we basically define some source uh, for the shared object, we then compile the shared object, and then we write this uh, basically write the LD preload uh, config to the GitHub env environment variable. And then once we do this, um, any further steps uh, are going to have that LD preload appended, um, and then we have code execution on every single step for going forward. So let's have a look at some real findings that we've identified. So the first one that we discovered uh, was in the OWASP uh, web security testing guide. Um, and basically this was a, a workflow where it, it's basically like a whole bunch of markdown files and uh, there was um, uh, a workflow for basically checking whether the what was it? The, it's doing some checks on the, the markdown files. Um, and basically this check invoked an external tool called textlintrc. Um, but it was using the, the pull request branch from uh, within the run textlint check step. So basically, again, similar to how I mentioned with the ESLint, the textlintrc uh, can also support JavaScript. Um, so we use the LG, L the LD preload to hijack the subsequent steps where the GitHub token was used. Um, and in this case, it wasn't too impactful because it only gave us um, the ability to write to pull requests. So we could write to any like pull request across the whole repo, just add comments, delete things, uh, add labels. Um, but it didn't allow us to merge the pull request, which is a shame. The second one was in a tool from Microsoft uh, called Autogen. And Autogen is an AI agent framework from Microsoft. Um, and in the workflow Contrib uh, Open AI, it was also vulnerable to a poem request in the retrieve chat test job, which basically invoked, Im invoked some Python scripts uh, in the coverage step. So, I mean, as you can see here, uh, we also have some interesting secrets available to us within that coverage step. Uh, we have some open AI keys for Microsoft, uh, some Azure stuff. So it's quite interesting. And then we see down below that it's basically running uh, the coverage tool, and then it's passing it some uh, test scripts from our repo. So we just had to go and modify those, um, and then we have access to those secrets from uh, the Microsoft repository. The next one that we'll talk about is the from HashiCorp, and this is the, the Terraform CDK GitHub Action. Um, and in this repository, they had some integration tests, and again, these were subjected to POEM request. Um, and there were two steps that allowed control to be taken. The first one was install dependencies. Uh, the second one was uh, via yarn install um, in the uh, integration test uh, TFC step uh, via our local action. So kind of this was the, the extract of the yeah, vulnerable workflow. Um, and yeah, as we see in the install dependency step, it's doing a yarn install. We can control that with a pre-install script. Um, and then it's also using the dot slash um, local action. So we can just modify this. Um, and then we have access to this uh, GitHub token. So 
let's see what the GitHub token has access to. And as you can see on the right, in this case, we have uh, access to the content write permission. And this is interesting because it allows us to merge pull requests. So inside our yeah, payload, we can basically just make a request to the GitHub API to say, merge this pull request. And then if we look at the logs, we can see that it's gone ahead, it's made that request. Um, and in the response, it says merged true. Um, so then when we go back to the, the repository, uh, we can see that we've now committed our pull request um, and uh, we have full control over that repo. So we've merged the pull request without any interaction with any of the maintainers. So in order to scan issues in your own GitHub Action workflows, um, we've created a CLI tool called the GitHub Action Scanner. Uh, it's given a GitHub repo, or well, you give it a GitHub repo or an organization. It will parse the YAML config files and use a, regular, a regex based rule engine to flag its findings. Currently, we have seven rules, and these can be easily extended uh, by creating a new uh, scan rule and dropping it into the, the rule directory. I also see some people scanning the QR code. I need to double check that the repository has been flipped from private to public. So if it's not working, check again later. Um, it should be done soon. Um, but if not, you have at least the link there. Save the link, um, and you'll be able to access it later. Um, and then, yeah, so we have those seven rules, and we also have some features that this can uh, be used to facilitate exploitation. So one thing that we have uh, is an auto-copy. So once you've found an issue and you require some validation to really check that it is exploitable, we generally don't want to do this on the target repo because they're going to see everything that we're doing. Um, and it's also going to interact or interrupt potentially like kind of the normal operation of that repository. So how you kind of do the, like the workflow that we use here is we basically take a complete copy of that repo, put this in our own repo with matching configurations. And then we take a fork of, uh, our copy, and then do the pull request back into our copy. Um, and this allows us to kind of build up the, the, the exploit, make sure it works. Um, but it's a bit of a pain, like it takes a bit of time to kind of copy everything every time. So we have a yeah, quite a useful utility in the scanner where you can just provide a GitHub, uh, a GitHub token. Um, and like a personal access token and give it the name of the repository and it will go ahead, copy it and create a, create a new copy. Uh, it will create a new repository in your uh, namespace and commit that repo to uh, there so you can go ahead and safely test this. Uh, the other feature is an LD preload generation script. So if you want to kind of do some other kind of command injection things. Um, we have a utility that will help you build the uh, code that you need to run uh, to kind of generate and compile uh, the LD preload uh, shared object and also set the environment variable. And then finally, we have a repo discovery uh, utility. And basically, this uses the GitHub API to scan uh, for repositories within a given range of GitHub star counts uh, to facilitate vulnerability discovery on scale. So with this, we can specify we want to scan all GitHub repositories that fall within a range of GitHub stars, such as between 5,000 and 10,000. Um, and for any repos uh, found, it will automatically run the rules against the target to discover potential vulnerabilities. Um, and then, yeah, you should be able to access that later. So kind of just to, to summarize, GitHub Action Workflows are great tools for automating various tasks in the development lifecycle, but we need to be careful because it can be dangerous when used with public repositories. Um, be careful with pull requests and make sure that you're using the, the correct event triggers. Be cautious when you're using user controllable properties in the workflows. Don't use self-hosted runners for public repositories. Um, and yeah. These kind of issues are very common, uh, so have fun discovering them and report your issues responsibly. And thanks for listening.